Hey, everybody, this is Sean Rocky G with Airbnb Automated. You're listening to the Fearless Investor Podcast with my good friend, Kyle Stanley. He knows all about short-term rentals. This is going to be a fun one. Hop in. Let's go. Hey guys, just like you heard right now, Sean Rakajic is going to be going live with us in our Facebook group. Um, but this was this was a little different than what we usually do. We like to have uh, a little bit of fun with our our guests if they're coming on a second time. If you missed the first one, Sean talked about how he went from homeless to ten million dollars on Airbnb, and uh, just an incredible, inspiring story. And if you're not already aware, Sean's coming up on two hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube. He's the biggest YouTube channel for Airbnb in the world outside of Airbnb. And so we wanted to collaborate having the biggest Facebook group, Airbnb Masterminds, as you already know about, plus Airbnb Automated, getting together uh, big platforms to reach a lot of people. And we just did a, a general catching up on life Q&A and just seeing what strategies that he's using right now. And I was really surprised to hear about a few of them. Um, speaking of strategies, are you using Price Labs? If you're not using Price Labs, make sure to jump on and start using Price Labs to get better pricing. It's called dynamic pricing. That is the strategy. Price Labs is the tool that allows you to be able to raise your rates, lower your, your rates based on occupancy, based on demand, based on supply. Uh, it's doing it automatically for you and you get a free 30-day trial by using my link plus an onboarding call uh, training with the Price Labs team. If you're watching on YouTube, all you have to do is go down to the description below and click on the free trial. If you're listening on the podcast, just go to fearlesskyle.com forward slash Price Labs and you can get started on that free 30-day trial. Now, without further ado, Sean Rakajic with the Airbnb Automated YouTube channel going live in our Airbnb Facebook page. All right, everyone, Sean Rakajic here, and uh, Sean's in a bus, and I'm, I'm in a <laughs> on HD video here for the first time. I'm hoping it's all going to come through okay, but um, if you guys are joining us, you have heard uh, that we have been getting this thing ready for a long time. Sean, I mean, it just, it just makes sense, man, right? You have the biggest YouTube channel in the world for Airbnb, and you're about to break 200K subscribers. So congratulations on that, man. And we have the biggest Facebook group in the world for Airbnb for hosts. So we got to collaborate. We got to do something together. Uh, mm -hmm. And for those of you that are jumping on right now, I see Dean Rogers saying Sean is a beast. John on saying, hey, guys, what's up, John? What's up, John? Uh, yeah. Comment ask your questions. Uh, if you guys don't know Sean, we're not going to go over everything that Sean is on this today, because you can literally just go and check out his YouTube channel, Airbnb automated. Uh, but today we're just, I mean, honestly, man, I just want to catch up, see what life is like for you right now, see what projects you're working on um, and see where your business is headed. So how does that sound, man? Sounds good to me. Thanks for having me on your, uh, on your, you could call it a Facebook podcast live thing. So yeah. yeah I've never sure. done one. <laughs> well, hey, there's a first time for everything, right? Uh, so 200K subscribers, man, congrats. I know you're not there yet, but that's got to be a good feeling. Yeah, it's kind of cool that even though I took a sabbatical from creating content because I am working on new projects, I've only posted maybe a couple videos in the last like four months, maybe. Um, the rate of subscriber growth has been steady, which means that there's just still a ton of interest with new people in the space and people are just coming to find content on how to Airbnb. It's, um, it's a hot topic right now. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing, right? Like, I think you probably have these thoughts. Uh, any of the students have these thoughts, any coaches have these thoughts, but like, is there a point in your mind of like critical mass of like, Oh, it's saturated or man, there's too many people doing it or man, there's so many people doing it. And there's, it's such a hot topic that people are going to start shutting it down. Like, where are you at on all that? You know, I, um, I would, have before said no never it's not possible but um i've seen some data in a couple of cities that uh, disagree with that opinion that there's will never hit critical mass like for example houston would probably be the best example of a city that's hit that point mm -hmm. um, they, yeah. they have more listings they have more listings now than before covid right so what happened with covid is listing growth was steady in almost all cities everywhere and then covid right around march and april just like broke supply usually 50% drops, sometimes as much as a 70% drop of inventory Hosts got out of the space in mass. And then we've been seeing a steady climb back up. But for example, Austin still has only about half as many listings 
as it did pre-COVID, mm, where Houston yeah. now has more total listings than they do pre-COVID. So um, there are certain cities that just have more listings. And uh, we see in Houston, a lot of hosts have been selling their furniture. It's just not worth the squeeze. I'm not going to argue that critical mass means you would lose money, but it just make, doesn't make it as as easy to be profitable, I would say. So I still think, though, there are tons of cities, like still a majority of cities across the country that have opportunity and especially the Midwest. There's just not a lot of there's not a lot of hosts in the Midwest, but there's still plenty of travel there. Yeah, I've, I've actually got a couple friends of mine that are in Indianapolis, and that seems like a really good place to go right now. Um, so, you know, going back to the Austin thing, um, Austin has some regulations that Houston doesn't, though, right? Do you think that might be why the listings are low over there? Yeah, and this is probably the first time I'm going to say it in public. People don't read the regulations enough, and that's why right. people aren't doing Austin. Uh, they read like type one and they read type two. Those are the types of permits that they're reading. And once they get to type two, it's the one, it's the first permit that's non owner occupied. Mm -hmm. And then that permit still doesn't let you do an Airbnb business at scale. But people stop reading and they don't notice that there's a type three permit that you can get. It's just more expensive. So a lot of people aren't doing Austin because they don't know about a type three STR permit. And that's the only reason why people aren't getting in the space. So d tell me what that means. Type three is, is in like, you can just get a different type of permit that is going to let you do a lot more than the type one or type two. Yeah. So type three will allow you to be a renter operator instead of an owner operator or an owner occupied operator. Mm. Um, those are the three you got owner occupied, then you got owner and then you got non-owner operator. And so we just expanded to Austin two months ago. We just uh, did our first set of properties there. And all we had to do is pay the government. That's what they wanted. Pay them like $700, I think was the cost for the first year of the permit. Then it's like 360 uh, for each year we renew. Nice. So you're in Austin now too. Where, let's see, Dallas, Philly, Austin. Where else are you at right now? Uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Austin, Philly. And then just generic suburbs. So like Addis, like in the Dallas Fort Worth area, like Addison, Richardson, Plano, um, uh, Carroll, Carrollton, Rowlett, like a bunch of stuff like that. So it's a bunch of suburbs. Awesome. Uh, guys, we're with John, Sean Rockageach with Airbnb Automated. Post your questions. We're going to be here for the next about 30 to 45 minutes. Anything you have as, I mean, Sean is the man for Airbnb Automated and rental arbitrage. So if you have any questions at all, uh, that are not already being answered by his YouTube channel, especially, uh, I mean, what questions are not answered by your YouTube channel? Really? Like you talk about all these different things that it's super, super informative that anyone can build a business from that. And I know you're a big believer in just sharing the wealth. Why did you start the YouTube channel? Let's go back to what was it? Six years ago, somewhere around there. Yeah. It's, it might be no, almost six years ago. I did it because my best friend was a real estate agent and my best friend was talking to people about how they should invest their money into real estate. And meanwhile, I've got this little side hustle because I'm, I was still in the newspaper industry at the time, but I'm renting apartments and putting them on Airbnb. And just the, the debate between him and another real estate agent sounded so dogmatic, right? Like you, you have to buy a property and your options are either going for cash flow or um, equity growth, rate of growth, or just they're arguing over the, the paradigms of investing, but the dogma was you had to buy. And I was just like, I'm sitting here like, making money on real estate. And I don't even own it. So I was like, I'm going to make some videos about that. And then after a few of them kind of stuck and got some interest, I decided I'm going to commit to growing this too. And then that kind of commitment to grow my own business and, you know, video along was why the channel, you know, kept going and is still going today. Awesome. Um, I, I think there's also this level of uh, people like yourself and I, when we start posting videos and start sharing stuff, there's, there's uh, two types of people. I think, I think there's the ones that are trying to get business and the ones that are just trying to share knowledge and wealth. And I think it's very apparent on your stuff that, you know, um, if, if you get some business on the back end, it's, it's a secondary thing, but you're very open and honest and just very out forth about here's how to do an Airbnb business. So um, where does that come from? I mean, well, is, is that um, always been in you? I'll say I am the worst influencer ever. <laughs> so, um, I, um, I started doing the videos just to do the videos, right? right? Just to share. I, and, um, that's, uh, that's just something that happened like that, I guess is part of me is like, I love to learn stuff and I love to teach and share what I've learned. And I will hijack, like ever since I was a little kid, I'd hijack conversations with facts. 
like people want to have a, a like a casual conversation i'm like hey did you know this about that did you know this did you know that like so they're like okay google right and so <laughs> that's always been a part of me but now of course obviously social media creates leverage creates the ability to monetize and that's where i'm the worst influencer ever i've got i've got people who would like me to like they they send a request for like a coaching call and i'm just like i just don't feel like doing a paid coaching call but i'll make some free videos so um that's i you know there are people out there who are trying to monetize the Airbnb space, the education space, because there's plenty to learn, but um, I think it's more fun to make the free stuff personally. Yeah. Okay. I love it, man. So you, you say you got some projects going on. What does uh, your business look like right now? What are you working on? So I've fully automated the current Airbnb portfolio. Um, Haley is the CEO. She mm -hmm. runs it. A guy named Jason, who I recruited from stay Alfred, he's the director of real estate. So he goes and picks up the properties negotiates the leases, Haley runs them. And so that's kind of our flow. And then I just hired two new assistants. We're going to start building out a co-hosting arm. So right now they're actually studying my course to learn how to Airbnb. <laughs> so my two new assistants are now students until they know enough and they're going to start co-hosting. And we start growing a co-hosting arm because we we're at like 120 -ish properties and we really don't focus on co-hosting. So that's an opportunity there. Um, I'm in a bus, like you mentioned. I bought a full length school bus and I ripped out all the seats. I put in flooring. This is insulation behind me. This is insulation board. Um, and I'm working on, of course, making this uh, thing livable, but I'm also traveling at the same time. So instead of being in Dallas as usual, I'm a couple hours from you in Bakersfield um, on my way to lightning in a bottle with, with this. So I've got the water working, the electricity's working, stuff like that. But otherwise it's a bunch of plywood and two by fours in here. So you don't want to see it. Well, yeah. And that's what my next point is, is I'm sure you don't want to show it, but I'm going to actually call people out right now. Let's get like, let's call it eight emojis dropped on this, uh, this board right now. And if you do, then Sean has to show us at least a sneak peek of something in here. <laughs> Does that sound, sound good to you? Can you handle that, Sean? Oh, that's rough, man. All right. We got, we got plenty of people watching right now. Guys drop an emoji. Not don't, don't just do a like, I need to see an emoji. Do me, give me a thumbs up. Give me uh, a, a silly face. Give me something in the comments. It has to be in the comments. We get eight. There we go. There's one. Uh, we got seven more to go and Sean's got to show a little bit of the bus. Um, there we go. There's three. Okay. We're getting there. Four, five. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Six. We were about two away. Seven and eight. There it is. You got to show oh, okay. something. One thing, one thing. All right. I'm going to show you the, the, the toilet slash shower wiring. Okay. So by okay. the way, I don't know how to do wiring. Um, this, I, I've just made a door for this. Um, so this is called a composting toilet. Oh my gosh. Look and at that. In, just basically two by four, like I said, yeah. Um, and this is my wiring for my water pump. This is DC and I haven't hooked up a circuit breaker yet. Okay. So I've got a power inverter, but these are connected directly to batteries and to turn the water on, you take this positive, um, you take this positive cable and you clip that wire that you see right here. And that connects the positive and negative to the, uh, to the water pump. So the shower works. Okay. Are you, um, all are you I wanted to do is make sure that this thing worked for the trip. Yeah. So that's, that's important, right? You got to have a working bathroom. Uh, have, are you a breaking bad fan? Uh, no, actually uh, I haven't seen the show, but I hear it's a wonderful show. You need to watch the episode where they get stranded in their RV and they need to literally use uh, jumper cables to start this thing from a hand crank. And I just, if you get stranded, make sure you've at least watched that episode so that you're not stuck in the middle of nowhere. Okay. <laughs> well, I have 10, I've got 10 batteries, um, in this vehicle uh, that are not attached to the bus itself. So I've got three 200 amp hour lithium batteries in here. And then like two other Marine batteries. I don't know how many amp hours they are. And then four automotive deep cycle batteries in front of me as well or under me as well that I'm using just in case my um, solar panels don't create enough juice. I still have enough electricity to run the AC because it's, it's supposed to be hot today, right? 105 degrees or something. I don't know if it's going to be, it's really gonna be that hot in Bakersfield. That's wild. Yeah. yeah. Well, be crazy. why, why the bus? Like, is, is it just something that you're like, Hey, I'm bored. So I want to try something new and this seems fun. Or is this been a, a, a dream? Yeah. Yeah, this, the, it was not a long time coming. The The grand piano is more of a dream thing, right? I dropped out of music school. So I'm going to get back into writing music. At my birthday party, I hired a string quartet to play some of my most favorite music at my birthday party. 
Um, so I'm getting back into music. That's more the dream. But the bus idea, um, I was like, you know what? I want to do some traveling domestically and I would like to road trip it because I do landscape photography and all this other stuff. So I'm like, what, what can I what can I do that allows me to facilitate a lot of my passions and my current like profession at the same time? So um, by building out a school bus, I can make content. I can make YouTube content about building out the schoolie. Um, I could put it on Airbnb when I'm done and I can test like schooly Airbnb strategies. And then I can take it for personal trips to go do landscape photography, go see some music, you know, just get out of town. So I was like, the school bus kind of like, it's a bit of everything. So why not give it a shot? So you have the, the musical talent, you got the YouTube video talent, you've got the uh, ability to be able to automate an entire 120 unit uh, business. Uh, you've got the handyman stuff like you're I think a lot of us only see the Airbnb stuff. So it sounds like you're a man of many talents. What other things don't we know about you? Oh, uh, I like the anime Hunter Hunter. It's my favorite anime. OK, can we just admit for a second that like at the core of you, you're a nerd who does Airbnb really well and works out. That's pretty much it. <laughs> um, and I think that should be inspiring for people. Yeah. Right? Oh, I think um, so, too. Because the truth is doing business isn't ever really that hard, yeah. but it takes a lot of attention. Um, it takes, uh, you could say tenacity, but patience with yourself might be more important than the tenacity because tenacity more implies an adversarial space mm. where usually the biggest adversary in business is you telling yourself not to do it or that you can't do it or that it's too hard or there's too much to learn. So being tenacious is trying to do something where the world keeps knocking you down, but most people don't start business because they're the ones not knocking themselves down. Um, and nerds, nerds, they, what they do is they get curious about something and then they learn so much about it that that turns into a passion. And so now they know a lot about it and they're passionate and they have momentum there and then they start things, right? If it's a business, cool. If it's a, a chess club, whatever, they just start stuff. And I think that's, that's where nerds of the world can be inspired. My biggest TikTok video has 6.6 .6 million views. And all it is is a four second or five second video where I ask all of the kids from high school who forgot to do their homework and barely passed high school how being a business owner is now. So it, the mm -hmm. video basically draws the connection between kids with ADHD in high school that barely passed because they just forgot to do their homework because their brain works like that. Those are the types of people that end up leaving school and doing their own thing, something that they wanted to do. And a lot of times that led them to being business owners. And out of the woodwork, people just on this TikTok video were like, man, it's so good, check out this business. And there's, we're talking tens of thousands of, of comments where people are talking about their businesses that they started and how they're making more than their teachers or making more than whoever never believed in them as kids. Um, yeah, so. That's awesome. It's it's the truth. I love, I love that insight, man. Um, I mean, <sighs> I know, I know a lot of people know about your story from homeless, you know, to $10 million on Airbnb. Um, but there had to be what you're sharing right now is amazing insight, amazing in depth, uh, you know, knowledge that I'm sure you've acquired over the years, but looking back at yourself before Airbnb, are you the same person, but with a different vehicle to help you build a business or what is this business done to evolve Sean, if anything? You know, that's a good question. I, I think in the parts that matter the most, I think I'm largely the same. I actually had a thought about this, like what used to make me happy back in the day, right? And it was driving my like my 20 year old rusty Ford Bronco, um, either to work or back or to a friend's house or back and just rocking out to some of my favorite music, right? And that was, those were my, those were my good times. And then one of my favorite like memories from when I started my first business before Airbnb was I bought a, a convertible Mercedes. So it was my first time making a lot of money. I bought this convertible AMG Mercedes and I'm driving through South Texas. It's like 90 degrees, dry heat, beautiful, sunny day. And I'm listening to this, one of my favorite rock songs and just cruising, right? Love that too. Um, and now I bought, I bought another small convertible again because I kind of like that feel and I'll do the same thing. I'll just zip around Dallas with the top down listening to some of my, my favorite music. The car I drive has changed, but the vibe hasn't changed. Cool. Um, so in that way, the things that make people happy do not change. It doesn't matter your circumstance or your or like your position, right? The, we, we are still the same most simple people we will ever be. Um, 
I think what has changed though is back when I was way younger, I used to be, I used to seek validation from people, right? I wanted people to tell me that I was good enough. Mm. Um, and I used to just try really hard for other people to get that, you know, to kind of win their approval. And uh, through starting multiple businesses and being responsible for other people's success, like if you have your own housekeeping team, right, you're responsible for them getting enough hours of work so they can pay their electric bill, they can feed their kids. Um, I had sales guys before and they, they were making commission. If I didn't put them in a position to succeed, they couldn't make the commission to buy their kids Christmas presents. Mm. Those types of situations where you're the one ultimately responsible for someone else's well-being, you realize it doesn't matter if anybody approves of you or if anybody likes you, you're here to provide like a path for people to survive. And so now my value structure has changed. And what I think about being likable or being liked is totally different because I realize it's much more important that, that you take care of the people who depend on you than to look cool to people. I think that's probably one of the biggest changes that has, that has occurred since. Yeah, that's good, man. I mean, I think it's another good way of, of showing that money magnifies who you currently are. Right. Um, if you're a douchebag, you're going to be more of a douchebag with money. If you are someone who loves to give, you're going to give even more if you have money. If you love to teach, you're going to teach even more because you have the freedom to be able to teach more, kind of like what you have done as well. So um, that's good, man. It's exciting to hear. I, I've got a couple more questions, and then we're going to open it up to everyone else. There's been lots of lots of fun comments, uh, not, not a ton of uh, the... Uh, stuff that I would have expected on an Airbnb chat with Sean, but we're gonna, we've got some good questions here, uh, Airbnb and non Airbnb related. That I'll start asking you. So, uh, co-hosting, huh? I, I, I mean, I've always heard you in Clubhouse and and talking about Airbnb. You haven't really been much of a uh, proponent of co-hosting. So, what's changed your mind about that? It's an opportunity for me to build more leaders in the in the company. Um, Haley personally does not want to do co-hosting because she likes not having a boss because I really don't, I'm not bossy with her, but co-hosting means that you have homeowners that you report to. Right. right. And her experience with the co-hosting we've done here or there, just the owners can be fickle. Right. And she doesn't want to deal with it. So um, I want to build up more leaders and I want to create some diversity in the company. And this is an opportunity to do that. Um, and I can't tag Haley in to work on it. So I'm going to, you know, mentor the co-host manager leadership that, that uh, we need myself. Um, and it'll be fun to kind of get back in and then I'll be able to do content from a different angle. In large, I still recommend that people when they're brand new, not try to start with co-hosting because I think co-hosting requires that you can prove that you can provide a property management service, kind of, you know, even though like you could argue that's not technically property management, um, Owners will be like, hey, you, there's, you're not paying me a dollar of rent, and I've just got to take your word that you're good at this. If you have a portfolio, even of just a couple properties, that's enough to kind of breach that. So I just think coasting isn't the first way to start, but I think it's solid diversification because at scale, if you have 300 or 400 properties and 100 of them are co-hosted properties, if you ever did have a, a downturn in the market, your co-hosted properties don't have a cost basis like rental arbitrage does. So I just think at scale, any big business should have co-hosted properties in the mix because it affects your cash flow and it gives you a little bit more uh, of a safety net just in case. Yeah. Well, and, and too, Sean, I think part of it is just following your market and fall fo and following the demand. Uh, for me, I started with arbitrage and that's what I thought it was going to do was just arbitrage. And I had never even heard of co-hosting. And then one of my friends had a house and said, Hey, what if you manage this for me on Airbnb? What would that look like? And I literally just created uh, a management contract that after doing a little bit of research later, I was like, Oh, there's a thing for this. It's called co-hosting, but it just naturally took off that way because I got him results. And then he started talking about me to other friends, other real estate investors, lawyers, doctors, mm -hmm. uh, real estate agents. And it just kind of, you know, caught fire from there. So like you said, it's just another opportunity to be able to create another, another leg of your business, another uh, leadership opportunity for your team. And um, yeah, it's just, but like you said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of positives and minuses of both sides. Um, so I guess what's the one thing for you going into co-hosting that you're most excited about and then least excited about? Hmm. Well, you brought something up. You just referred to something too that's kind of interesting. Co-hosting is a completely different lead pool, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll go to apartment complexes with arbitrage and say, hey, I'll take half your building or I'll take multiple floors, I'll take a ton. 
And a lot of the power of the deal is getting the landlord to give you free stuff, like free rent, discounts off market rent, the arbitrage, there's a lot of negotiation there. With co-hosting, you're, you're getting in front of completely different ownership entities, different properties than with arbitrage, because the ones that you pitch arbitrage are not the same that you pitch co-hosting. So that's a cool part about this is we can continue a rate of growth with arbitrage, but also have a rate of growth with co-hosting and they're not going to cannibalize each other. So I'm excited about that. Um, I guess another thing I'm excited about is to do some more outlandish stuff with properties. Um, and when you do co-hosting, you tend to work with larger properties. And my arbitrage portfolio is mostly apartments, mostly. Yeah. So working with really big houses, doing really just kind of off the wall stuff to create, you know, memorable properties, I think is what I'm most excited for. Um, if I was not excited about any part of it, um, probably that, yeah, I might have 20 homeowners that have permission to call me at three o'clock in the morning and gripe about whatever they want to gripe about. Um, you know, until, until that part gets automated, when we do pick up these homeowners, um, I'll be, I'll probably be the last point of authority again. I'll be stepping back into that wing of the business. Um, and I will have to be a yes man on the phone for a little while, but that's what it takes. So, yeah, you know, and not that, uh, you're looking for any advice, but after working with over 40 different owners, I can just tell you two things, make sure you have great onboarding processes, videos, um, making sure they understand the channel manager, how to log in, how to view their reports without you having to jump on a 20 minute tutorial and then just creating those boundaries. You know, like I think the number one conversation I have to have with my owners has been, Hey, you've hired me because you see that I'm a professional. So let's just let the next 90 days play out. And then if you have issues after 90 days, then let's come to the table and try to resolve them. But you will have those, those owners in the beginning. They're just like, why is this price different than this day, than this day? And why, why did I make so much money last month versus this month? And, and I'm just the same conversation. You just, you have to trust the process. This is a roller coaster. Let's check it out after 90 days. And then we can talk about resolving. You could be like, well, not only am I a co-host, but I am a coach. Um, yeah. I can tell you all about why this is happening and what this does, but my coaching rate is much higher than my co-hosting rate. Oh, so. I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> well, that's, that's just being funny. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I saw that with the very few first properties that we picked up years ago, we did some co-hosting when we first got into Dallas and yeah, people want a free education on what it takes to be a, an Airbnb rock star. But the reason why they're picking up a co-host is they're not willing or capable to put in that much work to learn all of the little nuances to really truly be top of the market because yeah. of course anybody can get an airbnb and anybody can succeed but um co-hosts make their make their way because they become top of the market at what they do and they get a performance fee so obviously we are going to dig into every nook and cranny of this business to try to like create like efficiencies everywhere and dynamic pricing for example is one of those things that people just don't understand yeah you know so they really don't. Uh, I've got a question and it leads into uh, another point about coasting versus arbitrage of your 120 units that you currently have. How many of those have come through your phone ringing with people saying, Hey, I heard you're doing this. I want, I want you to do that at our place versus you having to proactively go and do some research, try to network and kind of do more of like a, an outreach of marketing. Um, I would say zero are inbound, but um, I can't say they're like completely, literally not inbound at all. Um, so like, for example, my Philly properties, we just picked up six new doors in Philly through a real estate agent that I've worked with multiple times. I found that real estate agent by beating the streets, knock, like knocking on doors, calling for rent signs, ran into this guy three years ago. Um, and I've picked up uh, at least 30 doors from this guy, right, in Philly. And six of them came from him calling me saying, hey, I've got this new investor from New York. They're buying in Philly. They want to do a lot of doors. Can we start picking up some doors? So that's where I'm at with him. So that one was an inbound phone call, but um, it came from a lead generation from an outbound activity. And then that guy called me. Um, the recent ones in Austin, my director of real estate was calling around property management companies and investment companies and just trying to lock down deals. We agreed to like a tentative 40 doors with one property management company. We just picked up the first 11 of the 40. Um, and that was, you know, of course, that was us prospecting. Um, the, another one that's close to them calling us, we had a property manager at one property that transferred to a new property so that the general manager of one building 
where we had leases, they relocated within the company to a new property. And then mm -hmm. they called us and asked us to pick leases at their new building. Nice. So uh, I think that's the closest to an inbound that we've ever had, but um, we've never took to like taken a deal where somebody hits me up on social media, goes, Hey man, love your videos. Can you, can you arbitrage my space? Right. Um, we've never signed a lease like that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to ask you that question again in four or five months when you've gotten a little bit more uh, into the co scene stuff, because for me, month three was the last time I did any outbound work for finding leads. All of them have come in just through inbound calls since then. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fire that can catch in co-hosting for you get one person results. They're going to talk to the next. They're going to talk to the next. They're going to talk to the next. So I'm uh -huh. excited for you and your business, man. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, let, let's get to the fun part. Uh, lots of questions coming in. Let's, let's start with something really hard hitting. This one's from uh, Daniel. He says, non Airbnb related. What's uh, better, Texas barbecue or Philly barbecue or Philly cheesesteaks? Oh my God. Um, <laughs> Tough question, huh? <laughs> um, I think the Philly cheesesteak from Max's, um, north side of Philly, um, by Temple University. Uh, Max's cheesesteaks is insanely good. Um, and I think Max's Philly cheesesteak is going to win because I think the best barbecue I ever had was actually in Tennessee. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And hey, that, that's a good time to talk about this, right? We're going to be in Tennessee together. We're going to be speaking mm -hmm. in Nashville, June 6th to the 8th. You stoked about that? Yeah, I'm pumped. They wanted me to make like a video and I'm not one to really do fancy stuff. You can even see my, my videos tend to not be high budget. I just talk about stuff. So I'm going to try to give them something to work off of, but I'm cool with doing a 40 minute educational session with a black screen behind me. I'm cool yeah. with that. So I guess we'll see, but yeah, I'm stoked. I'm stoked to share, you know, my side of what, what, what I know. Um, I, I think the way that they're curating this, where they want you to talk about a specific like pillar of like information um bill faith is going to talk about some stuff mark simpson's going to be talking about direct bookings they want me to talk about scale and arbitrage um you know and we're going to talk about our 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 individual areas of expertise and i'm excited for that um to be like it's, it's gonna be cool like it's gonna be a a buffet of short-term rental knowledge and uh, i'm happy to be a piece of that yeah and uh mike has been talking to us mike Shogren. uh this is gonna be the biggest event of the year is what he keeps saying uh so if you want to be one of sounds like a thousand people are going to be there guys. Um, just, if you don't know what we're talking about, it's the wealth conference in Nashville, uh, six to the eighth, Sean and I are both going to be there. We're both going to be speakers. And, um, that's, I think we're one of 12 people that are going to be speaking about a specific niche in Airbnb and short-term rentals. So if you are interested in joining us there, uh, just go ahead and comment right here on this video and we'll go ahead and get you that link so that you can sign up. If you're watching the replay on this, uh then i'm sorry it's actually too late because it's past june 6 if you're watching the replay yeah. <laughs> and you know there, there's not really many events of this nature there's a small pro promotions company that did an event like this right before COVID hit that i spoke at but aside from that like the vrma um the vrma conference the people who speak tend to be people who own companies like right. guesty or wheelhouse or people who are vendors for operators like us um there's not really been a event where the success stories from the space, the guys who have built their portfolios, yeah. those, those it, there's never been an event to, to my memory that's large that is just chock full of the, the biggest names in the space as far as building the business and making the money. There's the, there's a security company at VRMA that's like, let's talk to you about security because we want to sell you our door lock. Or, you know, there's one that's like, let's talk about customer experience because we want to sell you our our channel manager and our unified inbox or whatever, right? There's always a catch. Um, this is literally just wood shopping, which is cool. Um, yeah, so I, I, think, I think the industry was hungry for an event like this and had 2020 not happened, we probably would have seen something a little bit earlier. Um, so for that reason, I think Mike and Bill putting this on is super, super good timing and, um, and exciting for all of us who are gonna be there. So again, Throw a comment down on uh, this Facebook post if you want the link, and we'll go ahead and drop it so that you guys can join us there. Um, the next question is from Rachel, but before I ask it, um, I, I need to preface it with a pre-question. Uh, we had three changes with Airbnb recently, the categories, uh, guest, 
um, guest air cover, and then the split stays. Um, what are your thoughts on these changes if you have any strong opinions about them? Well, the split stays is the way to compete with hotels, right? Um, Airbnb has an issue with being able to provide spaces for more than 16 people in one space now because of anti-parties. So how do they provide um, stays for 40 people without violating their own policy? Mm -hmm. So a hotel, uh, you can rent out a whole hotel and have 200, 600 people stay, right? Airbnb is trying to take market share from hotels. There's that. Um, their air cover changed. They were a little bit ambitious and they realized they really overstepped. And I think their change to air cover where you know, they were going to, they were going to charge hosts for the relocation costs. Like right. if they had to give somebody a new, a new Airbnb, the host was going to pay the difference. Like the one that lost a reservation. Well, I, they, I think they backpedaled on that because they would be in a legal conundrum where their, their terms of service say that our contracts with their guests are direct, right? We have a contract with the guest, right? right. Airbnb's COVID cancellation policy change was a violation of that, you know, direct contract. And then this would have been another form of that same breach where we have a direct we have a reservation with a guest that's ours to manage. That's, that's ours to handle Airbnb stepping in, in certain places. And then, you know, of course, taking money from a host like this uh, would cause, of course, another big outcry and they would have had a huge uh, PR mess and they probably would have gotten sued. So I think that's why their air cover change is just simply now changing the definition of clean and giving people 72 hours instead. And then of course they're making promises to guests because what they're, I think what they're finding is, is that the, com the competitors like VRBO and other boutique listing sites and, um, you know, and hotels are coming around too with what they're, with what they're offering. And Airbnb is feeling a loss of market share, I think in the, the home share community. So they're trying to, they're trying to renew that outlandish promise that they used to give people to get them back in. And, the, you know, the data shows that Airbnb is actually for hosts, one of the lower um, average revenue per night uh, platforms to collect money from. So the, I think they're, they're really trying to keep the, um, the lion's share of the travelers because yeah. if they can keep all the travelers, then the hosts are going to stay. Right. And that's, I think, another reason why they've changed their air cover, because by making a promise to the customer, the paying customer, in a way, it protects the market share for the hosts that are on the platform. Of course, the worst hosts are going to fall out because the worst hosts will, you know, be getting, you know, refunds left and right. But Airbnb wants to retain their best hosts. And the, if the, the if the good hosts don't have to give refunds because they don't ever do a bad job, then these kinds of changes won't affect them. I think that's Airbnb's you know, thoughts on that. I, I think that's incredible perspective, to be honest, because, you know, um, uh, let's be honest, as soon as COVID hit, a lot of hosts, you know, threw up their arms in anger. And it was suddenly, you know, Airbnb went from really heavy on helping the host to really heavy on helping the guests. Uh, but there's always, you know, if, if it wasn't for the hosts, Airbnb doesn't make money, right? But that in itself showing the circle of life of how that actually impacts the host in a positive way and taking it away from, oh, Airbnb is, you know, they're all they're trying to do is please the guests and, and help the guests. Well, yeah, that does help the host. And, and that's, mm -hmm. I think that's a really good way for people to think of it. And just like what you said, and, and one of the reasons that I also think that yes, saturation could be something like what we talked about a little bit earlier, but I do think when saturation happens, the, the hobbyists, the people who aren't serious about it, that's when they fall out. And it allows for the people who are actually serious and building a business to become even stronger. For the most part, um, I will actually slightly disagree. Some of these hobbyists who don't need the money um, will continue to do it, even if they're making less money than somebody would want to make, because they're cleaning their own rooms, right? They're hosting here and there. Um, it's, it's extra space. It might be like a, a, an accessory dwelling unit, you know, a grandmother suite, something like that, or a mother-in-law suite, mother-in-law suite. Um, it could be stuff like that. And so even if they make pennies, when people are trying to make dimes, they will be fine with that because it's, it's some money. They're making incremental money. And, and as long as it's better than putting a long-term tenant in there, they'll keep doing it. Yep. So the very bottom of the market, those, those hobbyists might stick. Right. And then the top market who always performs, provides a good product, they'll stick. 
the 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 bronze the, the silver medalists the ones that have good cost structure they might be feeling the pinch but they're big enough to scale to have their own housekeepers pay them by the hour dynamic pricing those guys will survive the like the a deflationary market in the space because they'll have a better cost basis than those bronze medalists which are you know you're, they're going to be comprised of newbies and hobbyists but who need the money yeah and those who need the money and don't understand dynamic pricing and are paying per job for their housekeepers and overpaying per job, right? Because that happens all the time. And who are making those very key mistakes and don't have good, like good vision with their design. So their spaces just kind of look average and stuff. Those people will fall out. And then that is the circle of life here that you're talking about. I agree. I just think, yeah, my, my only real disagreement to that is um, I think the, uh, the, the little guy or the grandma who bakes the cookies, who doesn't really need the money. She just wants to have a guest every now and then she'll keep, she'll do it for free yeah. in a way. I do you remember back when hosts used to give away the farm to their guests? They'd cook them dinner. They'd oh, yeah. like drive them places. They'd, they'd sit and play I, chess with them I for was four one hours. Of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's how Airbnb made its whole way. And that's, true. that's all I really thought it was going to be right. was couch surfing. I don't think, uh, I think Brian Chesky has actually come out and said, like, I never saw it being replacing hotels. I just thought it would be a couch surfing tool. Yep. Um, cool. So Rachel's question, um, goes to the third change, which is those categories. And I don't know if you have any information on this. Um, how can we get our listings to show up in those categories? Any tips or tricks? Uh, have um, you looked deep enough into that? I think to try to do that is a huge distraction. Yeah. Um, so Airbnb's change is a strategy for growth, but Airbnb is no longer a new platform either. And so there are over 6 million listings, right? I, I, I forget how many users, but it's an insane number of users, right? And even though Airbnb changed their categories to have these architectural, like architecture, it's like, places that are just insane and $16,000 a night. And then the, the tiny homes and the campers and the bubble tents and all these other, all these other interesting categories, that is just the load screen, right? That is just the guided experience for somebody who loads Airbnb and doesn't know where to go, right? It's like when you load Google now, you go to google.com, a lot of people, they type in google.com before they go to the website that they wanted to go to, yeah. right? Yeah. You just open your phone, you're like, I need to open up my browser, I go to Google first. Why'd you do that when you were, when you were going to go to ESPN or you're going to go to Facebook where you went to Google and then Facebook, why, right? People do that. And Airbnb is going to still have that level of habit in their current traveler base. So if you think about it, the people that you currently host, they're still going to load Airbnb. They're going to search Dallas or Memphis or New York or LA. They're going to search for dates. They're going to search for a number of bedrooms. They're going to search for the amenities that they want and they're going to load it. The only real change to that search experience is that Airbnb is no longer capping at 300 doors in their search parameter, right? right? If you search Dallas for four guests, they'll pop up a much wider range of, of um, space. And it might say 1,200 plus listings or something instead of saying 300 plus, plus listing. Yep. And what that does is that it allows Airbnb, um, I think it's more of a data management because they, they, what they want to do is they want to take the very best of their listings and push them to the first page. But what Airbnb has been doing is they've been taking not a randomized data set, but a, but a guided data set. And they take 300 units of availability. And then from there, they stack them in order that they think is best. Airbnb is now pulling a much larger data set and then stacking them on what order they think is best to try to ensure that the first 10 or 12 listings that show up on search are even better than they used to be. Because if you take the best of 300 listings or the best of 1200 listings, you're going to get a better curation. If you pull a larger data set, I think that's what they did not to get too nerdy, but to, I guess the point here is if you're currently hosting a type of traveler that you understand, um, you host like relocations, uh, students, traveling, medical professionals, tourists, whatever, if your product has been successful and you run a good business, this change, shouldn't really affect you. But if you're looking to take advantage of a new alignment that Airbnb is trying to make, and you want to grow your business by differentiating into a, a type of property that you wouldn't normally do, then now you can look at what Airbnb is trying to push and then do, do some market research and see, see how these 
see how these properties are performing. So for example, Airbnb is throwing up these architecturally beautiful buildings on their splash page, right? Mm -hmm. Go click on them and see how their calendars look. Are their calendars right. getting booked? Because if their calendars are getting booked, then you could imply that Airbnb's push is working. And just go through all the categories and look for a category that's got a lot of density in its occupancy and say, okay, cool. These, these, a, these a frames are doing really well, or these tiny homes are doing well, or these yurts or these whatevers are doing really well. Let's, let's see if we can find a way to attack this market since Airbnb is pushing it. And I like that. that is the way that I would use that data. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, oh, I've got a hundred apartments that I would like to have show up in the specialty splash screen. Sure. No, you're, you're the, there's no, I don't think there's a profitable way to try to take an average apartment and try to retrofit it to go up on this unique stays um, like campaign that Airbnb's on. Yeah, I, lo I love that. That's really good feedback. Uh, Brandon has a question that I think is going to be right up your alley. New to arbitrage and short-term rentals, besides the obvious cost of purchasing real estate, why arbitrage over owning the real estate for Airbnb? Um, what are the other advantages aside of just the cost basis on the way in? Yeah. So, yeah, instead of having to put a down payment, go through the closing cycle, get a mortgage, blah, blah, blah. When you're paying down your mortgage, part of that goes to principal. So you're making money on your mortgage, which is cool, but you can't reuse that until you refi, right? So there, some of your money becomes stale, right? It becomes unusable. Um, and that slows down your rate of growth. And I think rate of growth is my favorite part of arbitrage. If you, oh, and also free rent. So take rate of growth, lower cash invested and the free rent, and you can do some really insane things. So if you go to a landlord and say, hey, I'll take five apartments off your hands. And I want the first two months of rent for free. The first eight weeks of rent for free. I'll pay you, I'll pay you one month of rent and I'll pay you a half month security deposit. And so let's say that costs you $3,000. And then you spend $4,000 furnishing the doors, right? Let's say, or 4,500. So let's say you spend $7,500 per door on five doors. So now you've put in about 35,000 ish dollars on five apartments, but then the next two months of rent are free. So you're not going to pay rent now for three months because you paid the first month of rent and you got two months free. So over the next three months, you have $4,000 per door of free cash that could have paid rent, but you didn't have to. So if those $2,000 per month apartments are making say $4,000 per month and your net income on those are say the only a thousand bucks, let's see you only make a thousand a month of those after your other costs of cleaning and, and utilities. Well, if a thousand a month will make you 10 grand, but you also got 4,000 times five back, right? So now you've got another 20 grand. So now you've got $30,000 again at the end of three months. So you take your $30,000, you pay your 10 grand in rent for month four, you got 20,000 bucks left. You can do three more doors essentially. And now you're at eight doors coming in, like coming through month four, you're setting up doors six, seven, and eight. And you get free run on those. And then you can, in a couple more months, you pick up a couple more and then a couple more. So the rate of growth is really awesome when you have free rent on the front. And that's one of the things that I like most about arbitrage. Um, I will argue that a, a lease, a residential lease is kind of like the most unregulated form of debt that exists to date. Because if I went to landlord A and applied for five doors and they approved me, let's say, let's say, let's say they needed to see $10,000 a month in deposits and like you know, bank statements that was for four months of bank statements. Let's say the landlord needed to see $10,000 a month in my bank statement. And then he approves me for five leases. Well, I go to landlord B, I do the same thing. They ask for another, I ask for another five leases. They look at the same bank statement, same $10,000 they approved me. I also go to landlord C, do it again. And landlord D, do it again. None of these guys are checking with each other. Nothing's on my credit score showing that I'm shopping around for leases. Yep. Nothing's on my credit saying that I have 40 leases already. I'm leveraging $10,000 a month in cash flow out of a bank account. And I can pick up hundreds of leases at the same exact time, as long as they're with different landlords who don't communicate, which obviously they don't like, they don't check like, Hey, I'm going to rent to this guy, Sean, did he apply with you too? Is he renting? No. So in a way, residential leases, are this hyper unregulated form of debt because what you get is you get control of a property 
you say, hey, landlord, I'd like to have your space for three years. I will pay you $75,000 for your space, but I'm going to make you payments on it. Yeah. That's just like a car lease, right? And a car lease is a debt product. So a residential lease is a debt product. It's just not regulated. So if you, if you really wanted to leverage to the moon, get a thousand leases and, and, and go for it. Yeah. So that's awesome. another one of my favorite things about arbitrage. Awesome. Uh, Brandon, I think that is a phenomenal answer to your question. Thanks for asking that question. And uh, Sean, we got time for two more questions, about five minutes left here. We're right. going to take one from Simone and one from Gracie. Uh, Simone says, and she, she says she's in Phoenix. I think just overall, um, maybe just applying this to any market. Um, would you recommend a three bedroom home for $2,300 of rent or a one bedroom home for $1,600 of rent? And I know there's a lot of missing information there to help make that decision, but overall, uh, what's your initial thoughts on that? Um, when I negotiate rents with a landlord, I will take their one bedroom price and I will raise the rent by say like 12% per bedroom added. So take 1600, multiply that by 1.12 and then multiply that again by 1.12. And if it's less than $2,300, I'd go back to the landlord and say, this is what I'll pay you for the three bedroom. That's what I would do. Um, that's one of my negotiating things. But whether you take either or actually depends on the consumer that is best to be serviced in your area in Phoenix. So a three bedroom property can sleep more people and that's going to target groups. And then the one bedroom will sleep less people but has a lower cost basis. So you're gonna compete on price instead of on size. But you might be in an area where it's just travel nurses and individuals coming for business and stuff. And there's no reason for a group of seven, eight, nine or 10 to come to your area. And if there's no reason for a group of seven or better to come to your area, then the three bedroom is going to be a miss, like a mat, like it's not going to be a good match. But you might be at a place that's near like convention centers, music venues, um, places where families will travel to for some reason. And at that point, you might miss out on a lot of top end by servicing a group when you have a one bedroom apartment and down the block, Sonder has 400 one bedrooms also, right? So you're going to have to do some market research and identify if you, if you think that you can, you can determine if the one bedroom, the smaller group, like, like the traveling individual or the, or the three bedroom, the traveling group, you need to find out which one you think is under serviced and then attack whichever one you think you can better serve um, and where, where there's more money and less competition. That's yeah. what, what I would really do before I made a decision. But either rent sounds fine. I'll pay $2,300 for three. Take rent. both. <laughs> Go for yeah. both of them. Yeah. Or both. Yeah. Uh, if it was a, she throws us in, if it was a Spanish style home versus like a new build apartment, would that make any difference for you? Um, I love new builds because nothing breaks. Um, Spanish style may not mean anything to me uh, because uh, it's really not, I don't think it's really a factor. Yeah. Uh, your interior design is really what's going to show right. up in your photos. Absolutely. All right. Last question. I think this is a great one to end with. Gracie says, if it wasn't for short-term rentals and Airbnb, what would Sean be doing as a business? Oh, well, I was in the newspaper industry, right? Um, I would probably still be trying to make the newspaper industry thing work. The pivot out of uh, newspapers into Airbnb was happenstance because I started relocating employees. So I would probably be doing sales training seminars with sales guys teaching them sales techniques and all that good stuff i'd be a sales guy still awesome all right you guys know where to find sean airbnb automated on youtube anywhere else that you want people to find you oh no i think that's probably the best spot that's where the good stuff is um my tiktok isn't really that educational um i just don't think tiktok's a place for education but i'm there um so yeah if you want to learn um tick uh, my my youtube channel and then i've got a facebook group it's not quite as big or cool as yours but i got a facebook group so there's the the hosts of airbnb automated facebook group as well uh, and i'm always in there like people are talking and i i get involved which is you know so if you want to actually talk with me there's a shot there awesome and if you want to see sean in person and meet both of us we mm -hmm. were going to be at the wealth conference june 6th to the 8th hope to see you there in nashville again if you want the link to that just go ahead and comment we'll drop it down below sean 
This has been a lot of fun, man. We got to do this more often. Um, thanks for yeah, helping cool. our audience today conquer the world of Airbnb. All right, show notes for this one. And it was a fun one with Sean, fearlesskyle.com forward slash Airbnb automated. And you can actually see the past episode we did with Sean at that same page with show notes as well. And just like what Sean said, um, there's a lot, a lot of good stuff going on with Airbnb right now. There's a lot of opportunity going on. And at the same time, uh, if you can find yourself as one of the serious business builders in Airbnb, you can really position yourself in a way to be able to capitalize on some of the middle of the road people who might be affected with some of the upcoming changes and also the quote unquote saturation of Airbnb, which I don't really believe uh, to be a thing, but as Sean mentioned, it could be a thing in some certain areas. So um, I just say, if you're ready to get started, just get started. And you know we have plenty of ways to be able to do that. And one of the number one ways just to interact with me on Instagram at Fearless Kyle, go follow me, DM me, we can talk. That's it for now. We'll see you next time on the Fearless Investor channel. We're helping you to conquer the world of Airbnb.